please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. As a reminder, please turn all devices to silent at this time. Thank you. Places around the world where it's illegal, dangerous, maybe even deadly to own a Bible, to practice your Christian faith. We began as Bible smugglers and still today we're Bible smugglers. Our mission is to be present with persecuted Christians where they're at and to build a global community of courageous faith. Right now, persecution is as high as it's ever been in the modern era. You have 350 million Christians that live in an area where there's severe persecution because they're followers of Jesus. Now, when you look at places that are difficult to practice your faith, dangerous, even fatal to be a Christian, you have stories of victory. And that story needs to be told because the church is victorious in these places. We lead the way in telling these stories of victory, but we also need to connect people with the things that are happening on the ground. That's our challenge. We've got to know the personal stories of these believers so that we can help them, so we give them the practical support that they need, but so that we can also understand the story and the power of their testimony. In Revelations, it says that the end times will be overcome by what Jesus did on the cross and the power of our testimony. And I think what people need to understand is that stories matter, a testimony, a story of victory, how God was able to do amazing things in difficult circumstances it has ripple effects around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2023 International Religious Freedom Summit. Please welcome IRF Summit co-chairs, Dr. Katrina Lantos-Sweat and Ambassador Sam Brownback. Good morning. Good morning, Katrina. Good morning, to Sam. <laughs> be able to join you on stage here for Earth Summit 2023. Delighted you're all here. We're going to have a fantastic event. Indeed, I believe this will be an epic event that we're going to have, that the relationships built here and the activities coming out of here will literally change the world. And we need to change this world where there's so much persecution, there's so much difficulty that's taking place to religious people all over the world of all stripes. Now we've got a pretty simple theme for the Earth Summit. It's a bumper sticker. So I come from the political world and bumper stickers, if you can't get your thought down to a bumper sticker, you can't convey it. And ours is religious freedom for everybody, everywhere, all the time. That's the theme. That's what we're about. That's what we do. And the beauty of it is that this is a God-given right that unfortunately is being trampled on, limited, or threatened everywhere around the world. It's a right in the original charter, the UN Human Rights Charter. It's a mighty and a deep human right. It is the human right of which is most important to us, and that is it's the human right of the soul. A human right so profound and central to us that we are as humans, people will often suffer and even die for this human right. It's a right authoritarian regimes and governments fear. 
If people of every faith will stand strong and together for this fundamental human dignity, there is no government that can... There we go. 80% of the people in the world identify with a faith or a religion. No government can put down 80% of their people. And it's another point. If we don't respect each other's freedom of religion, we will have the clash of civilizations. We are already seeing this, where civilizations clash and underneath the pinnings of that are religions that are in clash. Ours is a huge task. Freedom for the soul and respect for each other. We will not talk about theology from this stage because we don't agree on theology. We will talk about a common human right. Freedom to do with my own soul what I see fit. We want collaboration from this event. We are gathering and fighting here for the abused and beaten, even killed religious minorities that even now are huddled in secret places yearning with all their heart to worship God as they believe they should. And is that too much to ask? It is not. What we are doing is a worthwhile task that will be part of our inheritance in heaven. When we fight and save a life or help free a soul from tyranny, we literally changed the world. That's a noble cause, and it's unusual and uncommon work, but let's get about it. Let's change the world. Welcome to Earth Summit 2023. Thank you so much, Sam. It is wonderful to be here with all of you. The word hope is one that has not been far from my lips and my heart over the last few months. Let me tell you a few of the ways in which I've been using that word. I hope we will have the resources to make this Earth Summit happen. Check. I hope that we will be able to get fantastic speakers to come and enlighten and educate our participants. We have definitely done that. I hope that friends and fellow activists from around the world will be able to join us so that this will truly be an international religious freedom summit. And that too has come to pass. And more prospectively, I have thought that I hope that the results of this wonderful gathering will be greater in awareness, changes in policies, alleviation of suffering, and strengthen networks of support and compassion. And I am optimistic, because optimism is a quality of hope, that in fact, some of those goals will be achieved. But as this summit begins, I find myself remembering, recalling another definition of hope. One offered by Václav Havel. He was the Czechoslovakian dissident and author and political prisoner who spent many years in jail before becoming the first democratically chosen leader of Czechoslovakia and then the Czech Republic. He had a more muscular and I might say even heroic definition of hope. He said, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. My friends, I have a deep certainty that our work to defend and advance freedom of religion, conscience, and belief for everyone, everywhere, all the time, makes profound sense. In fact, it makes more sense than almost any worthy cause we could dedicate ourselves to. We are, as my colleague said, fighting for the most fundamental of human rights, the right for each of us to live our lives in accordance with the dictates of our own conscience. And we know that societies that do a good job of protecting this first freedom also protect that full range of other precious rights that we cherish, whether it's freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, and more. Societies that defend religious freedom are more peaceful, they are less likely to incubate extremism, and interestingly and of importance to me, women do better in these societies. So we can have that certainty that what we are doing in Václav Havel's words makes sense. But what about the rest of his definition? Namely that we can claim hope for this worthy endeavor 
regardless of how things turn out. Just in the last few days, we've been talking about tragedies around the world. One that resonates in great sorrow with me is the massacre, the intentional massacre of nine Ahmadi believers in Burkina Faso, dragged out of their mosque and one by one ordered to renounce their faith or face death. And each one of them stayed true to their faith and was murdered, massacred in front of the eyes of their families and friends. How do we square hope with what is sometimes the very daunting and devastating reality of the repression of religious freedom in so many parts of the world? I believe, I really do believe, that true hope comes from the knowledge that you and I have anchored our life and our work in the pursuit of something that is right and lasting and true. We are doing that work at this wonderful summit. And I truly believe that in that sense, we can have hope that the seeds we are sowing, the trees we are cultivating, will most assuredly bear fruit in time. And with that said, let's get to work. Thank you so much. A warm welcome to Chairman, House Foreign Affairs Committee, Congressman Michael McCall, and co-chair of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, Congressman James McGovern, in conversation with President, Family Research Council, Tony Perkins, and Executive Director of the Aspen Institute Religion and Society Program, Dr. Simran Singh. Congressman McCall, if you, you may for right. your remarks. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank all of you. It's great to be here today. I wish I had a better story about my arm, but I was picking up a piece of luggage in my bicep uh, tour. So getting a little bit older these days. Um, but what a great conference. And uh, thanks for having me. I'm, um, you know, Pope Francis once said that religious freedom is a fundamental human right. And that's why religious freedom is a cornerstone of free societies, especially here in the United States where it's enshrined in our Constitution, <clears throat> where the, our founding fathers said Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We often call it the first freedom, not only because it is first in the Bill of Rights, but because it is a right from which all other rights flow. Religious freedom is part of our national identity. That's why it's a critical component of U.S. foreign policy. The United States must continue to be a voice for the voiceless who are persecuted for their beliefs. I was proud when Congress reauthorized the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom last year. This program can now continue to shine a light on persecution around the world. And I want to thank the Commission for its important work. Tragically, religious freedoms remain increasingly under assault around the world. In China, the Chinese Communist Party is conducting an all-out assault on religion. As we speak here today, they are attempting to completely dismantle the Tibetan Buddhism and the Dalai Lama. They persecute Christians who refuse to turn their backs on their faith and join government-controlled churches. And they are committing genocide against Uyghur Muslims. The stories of forced sterilizations, forced abortions, brainwashing, and even murder are horrifying. That's why I was so honored to lead a resolution condemning the CCP's genocide against the Uyghurs that passed the House in 2021. And I want to thank my good friend, uh, Congressman Jim McGovern, for his great work on human rights. And we often work on these bills together. In Afghanistan, the situation has declined rapidly since the United States withdrew, paving the way for the Taliban to take over. Afghans, many of whom only ever knew the freedoms of the last 20 years, are now forced to live under Sharia law. 
At the same time, the Taliban is hunting down Christians and other non-Muslims. They now live in constant fear of being killed for their faith. And of course, it's the women in Afghanistan who have really suffered the most. Women no longer have rights. They must remain fully covered outside of their homes. They can't go to school. They can't even go outside without a male companion. And it's heartbreaking to me to see what their lives have become. The women in Afghanistan, unfortunately, aren't alone in their suffering. The brutal regime in Iran continues to persecute women under the guise of religion. Just last year, they brutally murdered Masa Amini, a young woman only 22 years old, simply for not wearing her hijab correctly. But I'm proud of the women there who have taken to the streets to bravely protest the Iranian regime and demand freedom. And to all those listening, we stand with you. In Africa, Open Doors reported in January of this year that Nigeria accounted for nearly 90% of the total number of Christians killed and kidnapped worldwide in 2022. And here in our hemisphere, the Ortega regime in Nicaragua continues to attack the Catholic Church. They have imprisoned priests, including Bishop Alvarez, for simply speaking out in support of religious freedom and human rights. Globally, anti-Semitism is tragically still on the rise. Just last week, seven people were killed and three more injured in an attack on a synagogue in Jerusalem. That's why I'm proud to have just introduced the Holocaust Education and Anti-Semitism Lesson Act, or the HEAL Act. This bill will help improve Holocaust education so future generations of Americans are equipped and empowered to stand up for what is right. My father fought in that war. My children think it's ancient history. For me, it's one lifetime away, and our children need to learn the story. As the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I want to assure you I will continue to keep religious freedom at the forefront of America's foreign policy. That includes doing everything we can to shine a light on abuses of religious freedom around the world, and it includes holding perpetrators accountable. We must also send advanced policies to protect the persecuted, and we must help the diaspora in America that have family and friends that, are, that have been persecuted for their faith. Because protecting religious freedom isn't just about doing what's right, it's also a matter of national security. By resolving conflict, we can help prevent terrorism at home and abroad. As religious freedoms advance, conflict recedes. And in closing, I'd like to read a quote from one of my favorites, St. John Paul II, that has always inspired me when he said, quote, religious freedom, an essential requirement of the dignity of every person, is a cornerstone of the structure of human rights. And for this reason, an irreplaceable factor in the good of individuals and of the whole of society, as well as of the personal fulfillment of each individual. So I want to thank all of you here again today, and let's stand for religious freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Congressman Jim McGovern from Massachusetts, and I want to thank the Lantos Foundation for inviting me to say a few words as this year's International Religious Freedom Summit gets underway. And I'm honored to be here with my good friend, uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman, Mike McCall. Uh, we may be of different parties, uh, but we find a lot of common ground and we work together, especially on issues regarding human rights. And I'm also happy to be here with Dr. Simran Singh and Tony Perkins. We appreciate your commitment to these issues. Uh, you know, for the past several years, I have co chaired the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission um, in the House of Representatives. And I hope to have that honor again in the 118th Congress. In that capacity, I can tell you that the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion is one of the rights uh, we have most often taken up in hearings and in briefings. That's because the right to practice one's religion of choice is so frequently violated by governments all over the world. Some examples uh, that immediately come to mind will be well known to everyone. Uyghurs and Tibetans by China, Muslims and Sikhs in India, 
Coptic Christians in Egypt, Rohingya Muslims in Burma, uh, Ahmadi Muslims in Pakistan, Baha'i in Iran, Yazidis in Iraq, Shia Muslims in Sunni governed countries, Catholics in Nicaragua, Jews in France, I go on and on and on. The list is way too long. As a practicing Catholic myself, I, I know how, how important and how personal the right to freedom of religion is. I am very aware that my right to freedom of religion is only as strong as that of my Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist neighbor. In our very diverse world, unless the right to freedom of religion exists for everyone, it doesn't truly exist for anyone. And the question that brings us together on this panel is why international religious freedom is vital to U.S. foreign policy. And I believe the answer to that is clear. Americans value the right to religious freedom very highly. It's a fundamental right guaranteed in the First Amendment to our own Constitution, alongside the rights to freedom of speech and assembly. These rights are part of who we are, and they are also enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose drafting and adoption in 1948 were led by the United States. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, countries where religious freedoms are under attack are often countries where repression and instability are the norm. So the harder question may be, how best to promote the right to, religious, to freedom of religion? And here's my view. First, we should lead by example. This summit is focused on international religious freedom, but we cannot expect other countries to take us seriously unless we are addressing threats to religious freedom here at home. Anti-Semitism is on the rise in the United States, and, Islamoph and Islamophobia is widespread. I'm sure Mr. Dr. Singh can share many stories about the prejudice that Sikh communities endure. Only if, we are all, only if we are doing all we can to combat these threats, attacks, and disdain towards religious minorities here at home can we expect what we say on the world stage to have the impact that we want. Second, I get concerned when the right to religious freedom is separated out from other human rights. The right to religious freedom does not exist in a vacuum. It is one of a set of universal human rights that are interdependent and mutually reinforcing. It is literally not possible to ex exercise the right to religious freedom in isolation from other human rights. We forget that at uh, our peril. Third, we must guard against the temptation to allow claims of religious freedom to be used to deny the rights of entire populations religious minorities, women, the LGBTQ community, or others. When we privilege one religion at the expense of others, we open the door to discrimination, to imposing the beliefs of some on those who think differently, and to political leaders using their power to give the dictates of one religion the force of law. That kind of behavior is the very def definition of the violation of the right to religious freedom. <clears throat> And I want to close by highlighting one deadly example of religious intolerance. Yesterday, uh, friends in the Amadeya Muslim community told me about the cold-blooded execution of nine of their adherents in Burkina Faso last July 11th. There is no question that the men were killed because of their beliefs. They were told to renounce their faith or die. And I hope that everyone attending the summit, whatever their faith tradition, will condemn, condemn this heinous act and demand respect for the religious freedom of Ahmadi Muslims because anything else would go against the values and principles that we all claim to support. I thank all of you for your dedication uh, to upholding uh, religious freedom for everyone on this, uh, on this planet, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Um, Representative McGovern, I, I, I wanted to um, pick up on, on some themes that you raised for us and explore them a bit. Um, like, like you, these issues are, are very personal to me. Uh, my family came to this country um, escaping religious persecution in India. Um, right now we're seeing immense uh, persecution in India on the basis of religious difference um, in India as in other parts of the world. Um, but the, the story I wanted to share with you all today is actually of my Uber driver yesterday. Um, after I landed at Dulles, um, got in the car, 
um, got in a conversation with the driver, he's from Afghanistan, came last year just before the Taliban takeover. And he was telling me that he grew up five minutes from the Sikh Gurdwara there, um, used to spend time with the community, used to eat dinner there. Um, and what, it, what we know now is that a few decades ago there were 200,000 Sikhs in Afghanistan, now there are nine. Not 9,000, not 900, nine. Uh, and it's on the basis of religious persecution. And so this is, this is what's on my heart today as it is with many of you, with the communities you work with and serve. Um, and part of what you raise here and part of what we're thinking about is when we're looking at places like Afghanistan or China or Nicaragua, um, Iran, um, we see how the privileging of a single religious community can come at the expense of other communities. And, and we can also see how privileging religious freedom over human, other human rights uh, can lead to other kinds of oppressions and violence. Uh, and you raised this, Representative McGovern, in, in your remarks, and I would love to hear from you. Uh, what do you see as the antidote uh, to uh, these kinds of experiences we're seeing all around the world? How, how do we shift culture in a way that ensures that everyone in the world has the opportunity to th thrive equally? Well, that's a, a very, very important question. Uh, and, it's, and the answer is, is kind of complicated. But um, as I said in my remarks, I mean, I do think that, uh, you know, here in this country, we can serve as an example um, by doing a better job of combating religious intolerance and persecution um, in this country. Um, we're not doing a good enough job, quite frankly. And, um, and uh, to those who say that, well, there's not much we can do, I, I, I disagree with that. But I think we can be a model. The second thing is we need to be more consistent um, in our advocacy for not just religious freedom rights, but human rights in general. I mean, I think I worry sometimes, it's not just the United States, but we pick and choose where we want to express our outrage. And oftentimes in countries where we have strategic interests or economic interests, um, we tend to soft pedal. Uh, the abuses that are that are ongoing. We need to be more consistent. You know, as a member of Congress, I, I believe that if our government stands for anything, we need to stand out loud and four square for human rights. Um, and we need to be consistent. And we are, are not always consistent. Um, I think we have to do a better job of being, you know, uh, having the backs of those who are being persecuted. Um, and helping to uplift their cause. You know, I co-chair the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. We have a program in, that com in, in the commission called the Prisoners of Conscience Campaign. I mean, there are many people that are arrested all over the world. Uh, they are prisoners of conscience because of their religion, and we try to give them voice. And so I think the deal is we need to be consistent, uh, we need to be all-inclusive, um, and we need to use our voices uh, to to, to, to demand uh, that, that, that things change, that we, that we respect everybody for what they believe and who they are. Uh, Chairman McCall, I'm going to go back to something uh, you mentioned in your remarks. And by the way, the story I heard about your arm was that I know the speaker's race was contentious, but I heard the chairman's <laughs> race was even more so. <laughs> so but, but I won. Yeah, I so. see that. So uh, I hate to see what happened on the other side. You mentioned China. And, and that is an area where there is clear bipartisan support. In fact, I appreciate, as the former uh, chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, Speaker Pelosi, former Speaker Pelosi's outspoken support for minorities, religious minorities in China. So there's support there, but there's, there's a growing concern with China exporting their technology and their repressive means to other countries, even in this hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So as, as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, what do you see going forward in a way to box China in? We know they're bad. We know they're bad on human rights, on religious freedom. But they are influencing many other countries around the globe. How does that factor into your position going forward? Right. And, and if I could maybe step back, the Uyghur Muslims, uh, it's really horrific what they're doing to them. Um, slave labor. Uh, and when you talk about solar panels, batteries, most of that's being manufactured in the Xinjiang province where they commit genocide. Um, they have biometrics to, to follow all their people within China. Um, you know, organ uh, transplants where they force 
people uh, and they sedate them and take their organs out and, and it's just horrific. Uh, some of the stories I hear coming out of the region, not to mention, you know, uh, Jim and I have been very <clears throat> involved with the Dalai Lama, Tibetan, of course, he's uh, was kicked out of uh, China and the Tibetans uh, were you know, as well. Uh, we know the history of Catholic priests uh, in China. Uh, but what you're referring to is called the Belt and Road Initiative. They're in 140 countries around the world now, uh, basically bringing their technology, their surveillance. Their, they go into these countries, they get them in, into a debt trap, um, and they take their rare earth minerals. Uh, they bring their own workers in, and typically uh, the countries will default on their debt. The IMF bails them out, and they, they get access to a port or a military base. Uh, a good example, uh, Tony, right now in Afghanistan, China now is trying to get leases to a trillion dollars of lithium rare earth minerals. And they'll probably get access to Bagram Air Base. So as we look at, at what happened in Afghanistan, the end result of that to see China uh, there is um, very unfortunate. But what I see also is the idea though, that we export our technology to China that allows them to build their most advanced weapon systems. And when I talk about that, I'm talking about their hypersonic weapons, for instance, the one that can circle the globe with precision and land with a nuclear warhead, that was built on the backbone of American technology, and I think we need to stop uh, doing this. Um, but, um, you know, the oppression is, is real. And right now we're looking at a, uh, something I don't think we've seen since World War II, and that is the largest invasion in Europe since uh, World War II, and now uh, the CCP, Chairman Xi, looking at, at Taiwan, uh, and the Pacific Islands, they are in. They are there. Uh, they want to overthrow the election in Taiwan. Uh, they want to suppress the people there and their religious freedom uh, in that uh, region of the world. And of course, Putin's war crimes cannot go without a notice here. Right. Um, you know, uh, Jim and I worked very hard on a war crimes bill that we got passed um, in the, uh, I believe, the National Defense Authorization Bill, which is a, a great step forward. Um, but the religious persecution, I think uh, Jim mentioned the Ahmadiyya Muslims, very peaceful, loving Muslims who are persecuted in Pakistan as well. And it's just very sad to see that that's still happening in this world today. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I'd offer a question uh, to, to either of you if you'd be open to it. Um, you, you invoked Putin. Um, we're talking about China, where I think it was you, Representative McGovern, who spoke to this as a national security issue, or maybe as you met Representative McCall, um, that, that religious freedom is also a national security issue. Um, I think if we're looking at what's happening in the world right now, that's absolutely true. Um, and also there's, there's an economic question, and then I think that often plays into who are we willing to hold accountable uh, and who are we not. And, and I would love to hear you uh, reflect on um, what what mechanisms we need in place to help ensure that we are standing up to all perpetrators of um, religious persecution, um, regardless of economic potential, in addition to the national security question? You uh, Well, on, on the economic side, um, I think it's important that we, we have to compete. This is a global um, power competition. And you have four foreign nation adversaries, that being Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. Iran and North Korea are giving drones and artillery into Ukraine uh, against freedom and democracy in the West. I remember Reagan, um, one of my favorites, was such a champion for human rights. Um, what would Reagan do in Ukraine? He would, he would fight for the oppressed against the oppressor. Uh, I believe, and he brought down the Soviet Union for what they stood for. And that's the fight I think that we find ourselves in today. In terms of economic freedoms, uh, we have to be present. We have to be on the field in Africa, for instance. Um, when I talk to African ambassadors, they say, you're not here. The United States is not investing in Africa, which will be the largest populated continent in the next decade. So I think um, it's a question of, you know, our American investment where, you know, we can compete with the great uh, power struggle 
This is a, 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 a struggle for the global balance of power, in my judgment, and the economic ties are just as important as the security ties as well. We have certain mechanisms, XM Bank, Development Finance Corporation, and other things to move this forward, but you know, Jim and I are gonna, we're working on ways to move this forward because when you lift the economic situation, like for instance, if we could do that in Central America, would we have a migration phenomena that we see at our southwest border? I, I think hitting the root cause of that, because 85% are fleeing for economic reasons, some for political and some for religious freedom, um, but the economic conditions, if we can lift, as President Kennedy said, a rising tide floats all boats. And I agree with what the chairman said, uh, most of what he has just said. I, I would just say that, you know, um, I think we need to raise the issue of human rights at every level, not just at human rights conferences, you know, not just at conferences that talk about religious freedom, but when we're doing trade bills, uh, when we're talking about investing in uh, other parts of the world that part of the condition has to be a respect for human rights. You can't persecute people because of their faith. You can't persecute people because of their gender or their sexual orientation or of their ethnicity. I mean, we have, that has to be part of the discussion. And to be honest with you, I've been around for a long time under Democratic and Republican administrations. It's a little bit challenging when you deal with administrations because uh, it becomes uncomfortable. And with, you know, we, uh, Chairman McCall mentioned the work we did on the Uyghur uh, Labor Force Prevention Act. Um, I'll be honest with you, there were some powerful business interests in this country that were very much opposed to it. And it was not an easy thing to get over, you know, the hurdle. Uh, because there were lots of economic interests entrenched on exploiting slave labor in the Xinjiang region. Uh, we were able to do, to do it, thankfully at the end, in a bipartisan way, which is important. But let's not underestimate that there are forces who will talk the talk on human rights, but not walk the walk. And I think ch the challenge we all have is how do, you, how do you keep constructive pressure up so that we're doing the right thing, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's an ally, even when it's somebody we have strong economic ties with. Um, because again, as I said in my opening remarks, if you don't, um, you're going to end up, the, the country that oppresses pe their people, for whatever reason, will be a country that uh, there will be violence and instability in the long run. Uh, and so it is not in our interest to just turn a blind eye to terrible oppression. Could not agree more uh, with that. And I do think that there's even a, a role for American consumers right. when we look at what's coming out of China and those businesses that are exploiting those workforces. I want to go, I want to, we, we've just got a couple, a few minutes left and I want to throw something in here, blow everything up. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about Nigeria. You mentioned it, Chairman. Um, when I was serving as chair of the USERF Commission, we were, for the first time after years of recommendation, able to see Nigeria listed as a country of particular concern. Congressman McGovern, you mentioned the complexities of this. There's no doubt that religious freedom is playing an issue in Nigeria. We've seen this administration pull back saying, no, it's more of an issue of uh, scarcity of resources. Clearly there's an overlap, but how do we address the religious persecution, religious hostility aspect amidst the other issues like the economic resource issues as well? Well, you know, it's very challenging. I mean, Africa, um, the Sahel is, um, you know, I passed the Global Fragility Act with, with Lindsey Graham to stabilize that part of Africa where economic conditions are so bad that it breeds terrorism. Um, so that, that's a component to this. And, and of course, with that, with the, uh, the various terror organizations, you have that religious um, freedoms that are being compromised in the region. We, we do a lot of great things. The United States of America is such a great, powerful country. We do so many great things for other people. Global Health Fund, Global Malnutrition. We're going to reauthorize PEPFAR on my committee that saved 250 million people in Africa from AIDS. Right. And so I think that um, when we do these things, first of all, we have to let them know this is coming from the United States of America. So we have the prestige of them knowing where it's coming from and the influence. And I think we can also influence behavior. Um, and we don't want to put money in corrupt governance. We don't want to reward bad behavior. And so I think we do have some leverage and pressure 
uh, when it comes to some of these programs that we administer, um, you know, particularly in, like you said, Nigeria and Africa, uh, to, to change that behavior. Uh, but it's not easy, and um, you have to, to balance that. But, you know, this is something that Jim and I work on. I mean, when you're, it's rare you can pass a bill in Congress knowing you're going to save lives. Um, and PEPFAR being a good example, 250 million lives. All the things we do with global health, global malnutrition, really in, in what I was taught as a Catholic, the, the life of Christ, the message of Christ, as a, like the missionary life. Um, and I think we can influence that, the governance and behavior in those countries through those programs. And I, and I, um, you know, I agree with, uh, I can't believe I'm agreeing with my chairman on every, on everything here. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I think, Tony, you, you, you mentioned Nigeria and you mentioned, you know, that um, there are not just religious freedom issues, there are other issues as well. And I think the challenge that we have is to make sure that when, that we address all of the issues, right? Um, and, you know, and, you know, I'm thinking like uh, I, what's happening in Nicaragua right now. I mean, Catholic priests that are being targeted uh, uh, by the Ortega regime. I mean, they're, they're targeted uh, not just because they're priests. I mean, the, the people are being targeted, the people who are standing up and professing their faith and their allegiance to justice and, and fairness and human rights. Uh, and so it's not just the, the religion, it is also what they're standing for. Uh, or in India, the case of Father Stan, who was, um, you know, who died in, in Indian custody. Um, I mean, that has been labeled as a, uh, an example of persecution against Christians. I think that's true, uh, but he was also a victim. He was arrested under these anti-terrorism laws that are being used to, quite frankly, uh, threaten the rights of a whole range of people. Right. And so I think you know, we don't want to underemphasize the re religious freedom aspect of in some of these uh, troubled places, but we don't want to overemphasize it either that in a way that might promote more sectarianism or that might not get to the to, sol to solving the, the, the real issues. But I think there's a way to do this. We have to look at this holistically. We have to have, it's just not one thing that, ha that has to be part of the discussion. And to the extent we do that, I think we will have some success in making progress. Look, this, this world is a really troubled place right now. Um, and even in our own country, we have some troubling issues and polarization and violence. There's a way out of this, and I think uh, many of the people in this room, and as evidenced by the very diverse panel here, uh, we probably wouldn't even agree on lunch, right? But here we are all coming together on the importance of focusing more attention on these issues and being more consistent and being more forthright uh, and being more effective. So uh, anyway, but thank you. Congressman McGovern, Chairman McCall, thank you for being with us. Simran, thank you. and. Uh, would you please thank our congressman for being here and joining us? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Please welcome our Summit Track Chairs, Logan Carmichael, Hulda Fahmy, Dr. Evelina Ochab, and Greg Mitchell. Hi everyone, I want to formally invite you all to attend the Defending Earth Track today, where the focus is advocacy in all its forms. We will discuss best practices in advocating for societies where religious freedom is most under attack. Throughout our sessions, there will be 30 distinguished speakers bringing specific policy solutions, legal frameworks, and new avenues to bring justice and accountability to those most in need. We will begin today with a very star-studded panel, including celebrities and military chaplains. This afternoon, we will zoom into regional solutions with leading activists working across Southeast Asia, China, and India. Tomorrow for our final session, the Defending Earth Track will look at religious freedom defined and applied in today's... Hi everyone, if you're in the hallway and you want to come in, I encourage you to do so now. Well, thank you all. I'm glad my pitch on the plenary stage got y'all to this room. Um,
My name is Logan Carmichael, and I'm the Director of Advocacy for China Aid Association. But for the past month, I've been moonlighting as the track chair for the Defending Earth track. Um, and along with 20 or so other organizations, we've put together five hours of incredible programming throughout the next few days. So I encourage you to come back um, to hear from our panelists and experts and activists that are in the field. So first off, I want to encourage everyone also, if you're going to be using social media, to use the hashtag Defending IRF Track. That way, you'll be able to get retweets um, and retweeted by the Earth Summit. So to introduce our first panel, I'd like to invite up Ms. Katrina Lantos-Sweat of the Lantos Foundation. Well, it is wonderful to see you all here today, and I have the very exciting job of moderating a panel with three pretty extraordinary people who set an example for all of us in the way that they use their, their fame and their stature and their huge outreach um, as a force for good um, for issues greater than themselves. So I don't want to do much talking. I think what I'm going to do is ask my three panelists to come up here, take their seats. I'll introduce them briefly, and then we're going to get right into the conversation because we don't have enough time, not nearly enough time, and uh, maybe we might even want to have a chance for some questions from the audience. I don't know. Is that, is that permitted, uh, Logan? Um, so we're going to get right into it. Is this on? Okay, wonderful. All right, so up here, I am very honored today to be sitting with Ennis Cantor Freedom, Miriam Ali, and Penn Badgley. And it's an indication of how pretty much uncool I am that I had no idea who Penn Badgley was. But I see all the, you know, especially all the lovely young ladies out there with their eyes lighting up. So. I, I'm glad to announce that I have since reformed. I now know who he is. I have heard about Gossip Girl, which I intend to watch all the seasons. How many seasons are there? You, you really don't have to. I, I want to. No, no, no. I want to. This is not. This is not. You know, being forced on me. Although I understand that he has a very scary new show he's in. How many of you have watched you? Oh, okay. People tell me he's pretty darn creepy in it, but just in the few minutes that we got to spend with each other, he seems like a really nice guy. So anyway, but um, what brings us here is, in fact, the idea of celebrating those, but learning from those who their lives, through their talent, through their skill, through the families they were part of, had sort of a little extra something that most of us don't have. When they talk, people listen. When they do something, everybody wants to know what it is. And it's very easy in that kind of world, when you are a celebrity of one sort or another, to really become a bit of a narcissist, you know, all about me, who, you know, how many likes, who is, you know, interested in me? What does my agent say I can get for this? How much money do I make? How many people want my autograph? I don't know if that's still a thing now. It's selfies, not autographs. Um, and it's it's sort of a siren song. It's a little bit of a, of a, you know, spider's web that can draw you in. But each one of these three really wonderful people have chosen to use their name, their notoriety, if you will, their fame, um, to reach beyond themselves for a greater purpose. So I'd like to start out today by talking to my very dear friend, Ennis, Cantor Freedom. And I will you give him a round of applause? Because Ennis is a very, very brave man. Um, some of you have probably heard that in just the last few days, the Turkish government has put a $500,000 bounty on Ennis's head. Ennis now has to travel and be pretty much surrounded with security most of the time. And he's a, he's a wonderful, kind of a happy-go-lucky person by nature um, and, and didn't really intend to choose a life where he would not only become a human rights hero, but a target of the worst regimes in the world, China, Iran, Turkey, North Korea, and others. Um, so, and we at the Lantos Foundation have the great privilege of honoring him with our highest human rights um, prize, the Lantos Prize, this, uh, just this last year. So I want to start out by asking you, Ennis, did you realize that first time you put on a pair of, of sneakers with a powerful human rights message, 
Did you foresee then what it would mean for your career as an NBA star and for your future and for your safety? And would you have still done it if you had yeah. known then what you know now? Good question. You know, first of all, thank you guys for having me and thank you for being here. Um, you know, I remember two years ago when the protests were happening in, in America. You know, all the players were putting uh, all kind of messages on their shoes, you know. And I was like, okay, so there is no rule against it. We can put any kind of the message that we want to put on our shoes. And obviously, I do care about human rights all around the world, not just in my home, my home country, Turkey. So I started to, you know, do a little research about one of the worst human rights abuses that going on. You know, my first first topic was Tibet, and I wanted to put this beautiful um, Tibetan flag on my shoes and just says free Tibet, you know, and there's nothing against it. And I remember the first time I put, put that shoes, went out there and played basketball, it was uh, the Celtics against the Knicks. I don't know if you guys are any Knicks fan. You might be a Knicks fan. Are you a Knicks fan? Okay, you're a Knicks fan. Um, don't make you, a fight, Sarah. I know, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not a Celtics fan. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I play for the Knicks, so. You know, I went out there and played. Uh, it was right before the game. You know, there was two gentlemen came uh, and told me to take my shoes off. And I was like, excuse me, uh, this is my freedom of speech, you know. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, listen, you, your shoes has been getting so much attention from, obviously, internationally. It was from China. you got to take them off. It was a perfect moment because I was just getting ready for my citizenship test, you know. Uh, so I closed my eyes. I was like, okay, there are 27 amendments. My first amendment, freedom of speech. And I told them, no, I'm not taking them off. <laughs> so at halftime, it took it 24 minutes for China to ban every Celtics game on television. 24 oh, minutes. Man. Think about it. That cost NBA millions of dollars. And after the game, obviously NBA called me to stop pressuring me about to not to wear the shoes again or whatever. But, you know, I... You know, I think shoes was the, the most easiest and mm -hmm. most beautiful way to reach out to the kids. You know, I'm, I'm sure everybody loves shoes here, you know. So, uh, and no, I have definitely no, no regrets at all. Well, you've paid a heavy price. How many years has it been since you've seen your family? Um, it's been almost 10 years now, mm -hmm. you know. And in Turkey, I'm sure many other dictatorships out there, you know, when you talk about some of the problems that are happening, in, in, in there, you know, they're going to put your family members in jail and they're going to do whatever they can to shut you up. So my dad was in jail actually for a while just because of I talk about the human rights violations and political prisoners in Turkey. I don't talk about politics at all. Uh, they put him in jail and, um, you know, it's been, it's been almost uh, 10 years now that I have not heard from them. Well, you know, I, I know this is very corny to say, but you stand tall. You yeah, really stand tall when it comes, you know, it's, it's really very inspiring. Miriam, you have a really fascinating background that I think everybody will be so interested to hear. You're the daughter of one of the most iconic sports figures in human history, honestly, not just, not just our modern history, Muhammad Ali. And, you know, we're here at a conference dealing with religious freedom, freedom of religion, conscience, and belief. Your father, when he was a rising star, sort of in the world of boxing and just with his brilliance and his good looks and his kind of eloquence and flamboyance was just such a big, big figure in the world, he made a conscience choice. He made a decision to change his faith from the faith he had been raised in and to become a devout Muslim. Now, yes, being an American, he had that right. He didn't, you know, have some of the threats that people even in our audience face. But he got blowback. It was not an easy decision or choice for him to make. Can you talk, if, if you have any recollections from your yeah. childhood about how how that experience impacted him and how it impacted you. Well, um, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. And thank you to my friend Jason for telling me about this event, Jason, with uh, Vulnerable, People Pro Vulnerable People's Project. Thank you so much. Just want to get that out. Um, my father, yeah, he got blowback. He was also very uh, grateful that he lived in the country where he could pray the way he wanted to pray. He actually converted twice, first to the Nation of Islam, then to Orthodox Islam, if you will. And um, he, he did, he was very grateful he could pray. But my dad, he was Muslim and a man and a human being first. 
and like you, he did take a stand. He could have been banned from boxing for the rest of his life. Fortunately, the That's Supreme right. Court case went in his favor. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of people, you know, when you practice a faith, that is a divine purpose for you. That's how you're fulfilling your existence in this life. And so his divine purpose trumped his, his career purpose. You know, and I always looked at him and said, where, where did that courage come from? Because I was born in 68. He was in exile from boxing at that time, stripped of his title. But as I looked at footage of him as I was growing up, I would ask him, where, where does that come from? And he told me, you know, my faith tells me, which is so unfortunate what's happening to you from a Muslim leader, there's no coercion in religion. You know, our prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, respected all faiths, protected all faiths. To kill, to commit genocide, you can't even extract that from our Quran. So as, as Muslims, we have to hold them accountable to what our faith really says. And uh, my dad walked that talk, his, his camp, when he was training in his, in his height of his career, were not all Muslim people. They were Jewish people. They were Catholics. They were Christians of different denominations. And so he lived that life. He taught us to live that way. And he knew, even at that early age, you know, it was like, I'm not exempt from speaking what I have to say because I'm an athlete. So people would say, well, you're in this country making this money. He's like, yes, I have a divine right to be a Muslim and make the money. And you did not give me this talent. God did, and I did. So he stood for that. And it's just a shame that all these years later that we're dealing with 80% of the globe dealing with restrictions on religion. And um, that's why we're here. Why is that happening? Why are we allowing this to happen? Why are we doing business? Why is the NBA not letting this man play? Because profit is above people and planet. And, and you know, unfortunately, the world and, and Americans, we don't know the details about what's going on. So hopefully I'm here to learn about all of that. And uh, my dad, you know, Parkinson's took his voice. And, and I know if he had a voice during those 30 years, he would have been able to do more and say more. But his destiny is what it was. But that was the biggest thing for us is that he doesn't have that boy, voice to be that humanitarian Ali that we love so much. So, but God bless him for all the things that he did do. Boy, he taught his daughter well, didn't yeah. he? Like, I think we need to. <laughs> now, would you be willing to talk just a little bit um, before we get to, mm -hmm. to <laughs> the mysterious and <laughs> mysterious Ben Badgley, um, a little bit about the work you do yeah. with vulnerable youth in, yeah. in Los Angeles yeah. and, and sort of how, how, if at all, you see that connecting to this issue yeah. of, you know, finding your higher purpose yeah. in life. You know, you talk about your dad's in such an inspirational way and, and how he, you know, viewed his duty to his conscience and his duty to God yeah. as, as being God given, but also something he had a duty towards. Yeah. It, what, yeah, Talk to us yeah. if you would. I mean, my dad took on a lot of issues, but one thing that I saw, and I think it impacted me the most, was he, he was this boy in Louisville living in a segregated society, and he did have, um, he, he was very in, involved with inner city youth because they, they deal with a certain oppression as well. And, and that, that impacted my decision to be a social, work, so, social worker. So I've worked for over 15 years in um, the highest crime poverty areas in South L.A., and gang communities, which these kids, they're not just gang members, they, they live in certain conditions. So most of my work has been around that. Um, I'm not doing de direct practice right now, I'm working on some other things, but um, that's been my passion for a very long time. And you know, a lot of them now, it was going on in Chicago and many areas, you know, they, they have post-traumatic stress disorder just like people in war-torn countries. And they're, they're overlooked in a lot of ways. And, and they live in, you know, areas that are lack resources and you know, opportunity. So that's where most of my work has been. Thank you. Now mm -hmm. I'm going to give this back to you. And can I get you this? <laughs> okay. I'd, I'd next like to turn um, to our third panelist, Penn Badgley, um, a, a well-known and, um, and much followed actor who has been in some really major hit shows. Um, but Penn is also, and I just found this out when we had a chance to chat for a few minutes before we came out here, is maybe a, a relatively recent convert, could I say, yeah. to, to the Baha'i faith. And um, I had the opportunity a number of years ago to visit 
the Baha'i headquarters in Haifa, Israel, which is one of the most um, beautiful sort of heavenly places I've ever been to in my many years on earth. And there's a very special spirit about that community. And so I, I guess I, I want to start out by asking Penn, if it's not too personal, if you're willing to share it, what sort of led you on, on a journey that led you to join that, uh, that faith community? Yeah, yeah, I can speak on that for a moment, but I do want to, um, uh, I'm, I just want to say that I'm not only humbled to be invited here, but I'm really humbled to be in the presence of these two. I, I think if we're talking about uh, religious freedom, this, this freedom to believe, this freedom to be and identify in, in, a, in a manner that speaks to your soul, no less, you know, the spirit of sacrifice threads through that life of, of, of that person. And, you know, the sort of public sacrifices that, for instance, your father made and the life of sacrifice you've lived doing the work you do and you with your career. I mean, I just want to, like, really uh, pay my respects because, you know, I, I certainly have not made any public sacrifices. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I, I can share a little bit about, um, uh, you know, I think here in the West, the relationship we have to religious freedom is, of course, quite different. We don't have um, – certainly we don't have secular authorities – uh, in, 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 in imposing, you know, restriction on, on religious belief. We, we have that freedom. I grew up uh, taking it for granted and, and quite, I, I think I probably derided religion, you know, in, in, in my mind. Um, didn't know much about it in my heart. And, uh, and I think as I, as I entered my 20s and was um, encountering, you know, some degrees of fame and, and wealth uh, on this show, Gossip Girl, which many people knew. I think I was confronted with what so many people in that position are, which is, ah, okay, so this, this truly does not bring um, the solace or the happiness that we, even though we, we write songs about money not being able to buy us love, we, we certainly behave like it can. You know, that's, uh, that's the religion here in the West. So, <laughs> so you know, I... I was confronted with that reality, and I started to soul search, and I did a lot of things. I explored a lot of, um, I started reading the Quran, actually, I explored Buddhism. Um, you know, I, I traveled to South America and to, uh, to India, did, did things like that. And along the way, I um, actually had a friend who was a Baha'i, who was uh, just another 24-year-old white guy living in New York City, so I wasn't as interested in what he w was sharing. Um, but 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 along the way, really, just the the, the Baha'u'llah's uh, spiritual but also social teachings for connecting individual transformation to the transformation of society. That was really that was really uh, and and the spirit of the faith, which is the oneness of humanity, is really what drew, drew me to it. Thank you. That's I really appreciate you being willing to share that journey, and it I think it speaks to something um, that makes this Earth Summit so special, and that is so many of the people who attend this event have, have sought to find the answers to the big questions. And, you know, some people wait a long time in life. I'm so grateful that each of you sort of have, at an earlier stage, kind of grounded your lives in things that really, really matter. Um, I wanted to ask you, Ennis, if you could talk a little bit about some of the work you've done. You talked about your work with youth. Um, trying to bring kids across pretty big divides together because you've done some very, very interesting stuff in that regard recently. I mean, I think basketball sports, I, I will just say, is an amazing tool to, you know, just reach out to kids and especially bring them together. So I was like, you know, I feel like I might be kicked out of NBA, but I, I still love the game, you know? So I was like, you know what? There are millions of NBA fans, millions of basketball fans, kids around the world. So let's just, you know, just go to this countries and different cities and organize basketball camps you know it sounds very simple but it's a uh, some of the some of the basketball camps that i try to you know organize was in jerusalem vatican you know i remember i had this basketball camp in jerusalem i was like you know what let's bring israelis and palestinians to this basketball camp and a lot of people said you're crazy you know they're not going to play basketball they're going to fight you know so i was like you know what let's try it. <laughs> so i organ i did organize a basketball camp and we you know invited uh, Muslims, Jews, Christians, Druzis, Israelis, uh, Palestinians. And I remember there was this one Palestinian girl, right? She said, there's no way I'm going to Israel to play basketball. But her family was very well educated and, 
And they're like, you know, the Ennis is gone. So you want to go and meet him? He said, okay, I'm just going to go and take one picture, and I want to go back. Um, so he ended up staying for two weeks. And after, one, after the first week, she apologized actually for one of all of her teammates and said, I just didn't know enough, you know. And I remember, I don't know if, how much you guys know about the basketball <clears throat> terms, but so I put them on the same team, right? <clears throat> and I was actually playing with them. I remember there was one position. I got a rebound. I give to this uh, Israeli kid, and he crossed someone over, passed to this uh, Palestinian girl, and she scored. <laughs> While she was coming back, they high five each other. I was like, this is the most beautiful scene I've ever witnessed in a basketball camp. And then the second one I did in, uh, in uh, Vatican after the meeting with the, with the Pope, uh, other, uh, some of the cardinals around him was like, hey, why don't you come and do, organize a basketball camp here? And just like two weeks ago, I was just there to organize a basketball uh, camp, and it turned out to be amazing. And I think what I see is just like, I understand there are so many conflicts, war, this and that going on, but my goal was like, instead of <clears throat> those kids are getting bombed on the street, we take him and put him in basketball course and say, okay, this is the right way to do. And then I see like, these kids are exchanging numbers and at, at the end of the basketball camp, they exchange in the social uh, medias and stuff and they learn from each other. So they learn how to communicate, how to uh, win, how to lose, how to you know play basketball together. So it's been, a, it's, it turned out to be amazing. So we're just gonna, after this whole bounty thing lift up, we're just gonna keep doing these basketball camps. So. That's wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask one last question that I'll ask all three of you to answer. And then if we have time, I don't know where Logan went, but if we have time, we'll take a few questions. So some people have commented or remarked on the fact that religion or faith can be kind of a, a toxic thing in society that pulls people apart, makes them you know, uh, repair to their barricades and sort of hurl criticisms and accusations at each other. And others have um, observed that on the contrary, faith can be a, a tonic, something that brings people together, that builds bridges of, of um, respect and understanding and even solidarity. So I want to ask each of you if you could share with us what it is you think either about the structure of a government, a society, or the way religion is taught in communities that can make the difference between it being something very much in the Baha'i tradition that recognizes universality and builds bridges and builds that genuine love and respect, and why it is that it sometimes tears people apart. So we'll start with you, Penn. I'll give you the thing, and we'll just go down, or we'll just go down the, the line. Sure, that's an easy question. I'll just yeah, right. take that one. <laughs> Real easy. Uh, yeah, I'll be first as well. Let me step up to the plate. <clears throat> Famously religious. Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so actually, I'll pull this directly from from my understanding of the Baha'i writings. The the, the the body that it is, the vast body that it is, is uh, is is imitation. Actually, so fr from the perspective from. Um, on the part of religion where it creates its own toxicity, I think, um, is, is imitation of the generations before us as opposed to a individual pursuit of truth, of knowledge of spiritual reality, which is consummate with knowledge of yourself, consummate with knowledge of God, um, consummate with knowledge of your neighbor, of, 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 of everyone, of all of humanity. Th th that spirit is in the the, the, these, these scriptures we have available to us, but many of us don't go to, 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 to that. And now, you know, there are clarifications to be made. However, I think like, you know, personal investigation of truth, uh -huh. that is actually really, I think the spirit that eradicates the, 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 the imitation and the foolishness that turns into prejudice and hatred and violence. Did a good job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I I think religion isn't the culprit; it's the hijackers of it. You know, people hijack religion; they redefine it. As a Muslim, I cringe when I hear an anchor say "Islamist." There, you know, we you'll see a someone doing a shooting, and the anchor will go, "I'm not going to say the name of this mass shooter," but we validate the definitions terrorists give themselves. Mm. So they hijacked, they said we're, we're Islamic jihadists or we're this or that, and they're using these, these pure names 
where you can't even extract what they're doing from the Quran, that name, you just hijacked that name. And then you have people who learn in sound bites say, there's something about that Quran that just produces terrorists. And it's nothing in that Quran that can produce a terrorist. So we, religion isn't the problem. It's how people are redefining it, how those definitions are distributed. And you have interfaith communities that understand this, but the broader community don't know. Like you said, you have to seek to understand and you have to believe a true Muslim when they say what their religion is. So whatever's in you, the prejudice, the bias, you hear what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. Instead of going, I, I met a young man um, who was a Christian who said he studied the Quran. And I've always said I want to study the Bible. I have Christian friends. I've gone to church with them. But just to understand it, because Muslims believe the Bible is people of, of the book. Christians are people of the book. But even if you don't have a religion, we're not supposed to harass, persecute, or kill. So, um, yeah, we, you know, we have to be in solidarity as all faith religions, all political figures. We have to be in solidarity about this issue because people are being raped, kidnapped, tortured, killed. You know, when I used to look at Holocaust movies in middle school and high school and learned about slavery, I never would think at 54 years old, 80% of the world would be dealing with this. We're going backwards. And, and what's happening is power brokers are in partnership with each other. And we're picking and choosing who we're going to cover. We're picking and choosing groups of people that can be killed and groups of people who can't. This doesn't make any sense, what he's going through. He's one nice guy with a, <laughs> a, a leader needs to kill him. So it's, it's a broader message in that, you know, these authoritarian governments at the end of the day is not about people's religion. Is people who are religious have a duty for justice, and they don't want to hear it. They don't want that justice. They, they don't want, you know, they want to control your mind. They're in competition with your God or your lack of belief in God. We want you to be loyal to this regime, period. So, you know, I'm here to learn, and so far, come, you know, coming upon this, this event, I've been trying to study on what's going on, and it's too many companies in this country and other countries who say they're democratic that are, that are complicit in this genocide, and, and we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And, and we're, 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 those, some people are vulnerable, but we're next. You know what I'm saying? You know, so we, we really have to spread the word on this. We're in a, we're in a global, we're, we're global citizens, and we're part of the human race. That was my dad's favorite saying, we're all part of the human race. And if we don't stop it, you know, we're going to be losing rights right here in this country. So we really have to, hold each other dear and love each other. And, and I don't have to believe what you believe or believe what you believe to respect you. And I should be able to raise my kids a certain way. You should be, able to raise, what is going on here? So it's really these, these power folks are, are very greedy and they want the minds of their nations. And they're getting away with it in a lot of ways. And it, you know, all we can do is work towards a, a better globe. And as we're gonna give you the last of word. Of course, no, she's, she said it beautifully. I don't know what else I can say, but this is, this is what I will, uh, believe in you. It doesn't matter what your background is, your skin color, your religion, or your background. The most important thing in life is live your differences on a table and trying to find what we have in common. Because we only have one world to live. Till one of those crazy billionaires find another planet to live, this world is what we have. <laughs> you know, so we need to make this world better together, and that's the key word, together. And I remember, you know, in our locker room, I, you know, when I played in NBA, in our locker room, we had you know, different colors, different religions, different cultures, and people from different backgrounds. But what we did was we left our differences in that locker room, went out there, and just only talked one language, and basket was basketball. And that made us better friends, that made us better teammates. And, you know, it was, just, it was just an amazing, especially in New York, you know, when I was playing with the Knicks, we had people from all over the world. Um, so what, I was, you know, what I'm trying to say is obviously like, we only have one world to live in. We are like a huge team. You know, so we are all part of this team, and we have to make this world better uh, together. So, please join me in thanking this fantastic panel. <laughs> yes, um, I don't know. They might might be willing to take some pictures with some of you after as we break up. I know there's another panel coming in, but it's been such a privilege to be with all of you. Um, it's been a privilege to be with these three really very special, remarkable, charismatic people, and. 
I'm so grateful that there are wonderful, exciting, dynamic celebrities who are willing to lend their voices to this cause. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of the summit. Yes, yes, yes. So can you do that? I'll get a photo. Do you want to see it? Okay, that way then it looks like we're kind of... Okay, um, Marianne, she just wants a picture of the, of the panel. I think we're going to see this. Okay, and then we'll do one standing up.